Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for another episode of Certified, Certiport's Educator Podcast. I'm your host, Hannah Propo. Join us as we dive into the world of education, certification, and technology. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for another episode of Certified, Certiport's Educator Podcast. We're continuing our series with our certified ambassadors, and we're lucky today to be joined by Miss Patty Eckelman. Patty, thank you so much for being here with us. Absolutely. All right, Patty. So for those who weren't able to meet you at Certified and who want to know a little bit more about you, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and your teaching experience? Yeah. So my teaching experience, um, I have 31 years in in experience. I've worked at four different schools, uh, all in Washington State. Uh, I'm originally from Montana, so I grew up in Montana. Uh, but all my teaching experiences in the, is in the be- beautiful Pacific Northwest. I have taught at three high schools and one junior high school. Uh, business education is my area, and I've taught all of the business classes. But I really have focused these last several years of fine-tuning and really emphasizing the industry certification for Microsoft and accounting. So those are my, my two important babies that I teach right now. And tell us a little bit about, it sounds like you've taught in junior high, but I know now you teach in high school. Tell us about the types of students that you work with. In junior high. Um, so I taught three years at a junior high. It was my second, third, and fourth years teaching. And I taught mainly keyboarding and computer applications. And in reflection, the kids that I work with, it was grades seven, eighth, and ninth, I had a ton of enthusiasm, high energy. I really, it started super early in the morning. I think our junior highs started at 7.35 in the morning. And so it's just super early. And I just kind of, I felt like the kids, although they were fantastic, I just felt that uh, the higher level kids were were more of my my speed, uh, more of the maturity. And I I really felt for CTE, um, career and technical education, I can really relate to the kids that are a little bit more mature, a little bit more dedicated, a little bit more focused. yeah, I'm a little more serious, even though I'm, I have a fun personality. I think <laughs> the middle school, it was junior high was just exhausting. So I hats off to all of the, the junior high middle school teachers. I admire them tremendously, um, but I can't even imagine how just uh, emotionally exhausting that would be. And so tell us then you, you worked and you transitioned out of junior high and middle school, and now you work with high school students. Tell us a little bit about the students that you teach um, over the last, oh gosh, over 20 years, right, that you've been working with for the last couple of decades. Yes. So the high school kids that I work with are are, are every single student. Uh, I'm an elective class, so my kids are choosing to take my class, or the parents are saying, hey, you need to take this class before you graduate. So not all of them are excited to be there with me. But I think once I get them into my class, you know, I have oftentimes I have my seniors saying, and where have you been? Has this class always been here? And, and why didn't I not know about it? And so, you know, when working with all high school kids, and that's, that's my kids that are planning on going straight into work, my kids that are going into college, my kids that are going into military, I have students that are on 504 plans, you know, special ed plans, IEP plans, um, I'm, I think probably the luckiest person in the world to have such diverse group of students to work with because, you know, every single kid brings a different challenge, not only for the teacher, but, um, I, you know, I create challenges and goals for each one of my students. And so that just, I think, makes part of the, you know, never a dull moment every single day uh, teaching in the high school. And to your point, I know, especially in high school, so I, I feel lucky enough to interact on a fairly regular basis with some um, of the local young people in my community, ages about 15 to 17. So around the same age that you teach and you never know what you're going to get with a high school student. (laughs) Some of them are so passionate and excited and engaged. And then some of them are just, you, you have no idea what's going on behind closed doors. Um, So I wanted to get your thoughts. How do you really get your students excited and engaged, particularly about Microsoft Office certification? What's what's the secret to getting students passionate about the subject that you teach? No, absolutely. And, you know, I I think you're right. I think it's making connections with kids, letting them know that we're all human. You know, we all make mistakes. We all need to set goals. We all have 
baggage. You know, we have financial challenges. Uh, we're all in the same boat, so to speak. And I keep saying, you know, join my boat. Um, we'll go places. Um, so when you look at motivating kids for certification uh, or for competition, the first thing I do is I take them right out to the websites. So I am in a, in a computer lab. Um, we go to Google first and we Google MOS US Championship. That'll answer all the questions about competition. So frequently asked questions. You can see the deadlines for the competition. You can see past competitions. You can see the competitions that qualify for the three programs of Word, Excel, and PowerPoint uh, for this past example of 2016 and 2019. Um, the other thing is I also take them out to Certiport. So certiport.com, uh, we look at success stories. Uh, we look at badges. You know, the biggest thing is I talk to kids that I think as an instructor, you know, I can, I can teach accounting. I can teach a finance class and kids can earn like an A, which is awesome. And it's kind of short term, goes on their transcript and goes away. I think what really validates me as an instructor is that I can offer them industry certification that's in high demand. Education is pushing uh, the schools to go for industry certification where kids can list this on their resume, job application scholarships. It's recognized worldwide. It can be used in the trade, military, college, workplace. So I really feel like I am hugely beneficial by providing this opportunity. And I'm the cheerleader and I provide the opportunities. And once my kids start getting certification, they just get excited. And so, you know, my goal is for every single student before they walk out my door that they take an industry exam. Now, in the reality, not every single one of my kids pass. Um, but the majority do because, you know, I never give up on them. Um, and then, you know, within that process, I'm teaching goal setting. I'm talking about perseverance. You know, what happens when you don't pass an exam? I haven't passed exams. So how do I rebound? You know, you go through all those phases of emotions, right? You're upset, you're angry, you want to give up. And then you have to kind of pick yourself back up. You have to restudy. And I keep telling my kids that these tests are designed for adults. They're not designed for middle school and high school kids. And so um, perseverance is something that I think oftentimes we get caught up in this uh, giving every, every student a trophy. Everyone needs a trophy. Everyone needs a ribbon. But in this case, the reality is, you know, not all kids get trophies and ribbons. They have to work hard for it. And so sometimes I think the journey of not passing exams or not having instant successes really teach them more in the long run about the journey. You know, obviously the goal is to pass the certifications. That's that's my target goal for my kid. Um, but I want them to go through that process and have that perseverance of being able to rebound. Well, and how much more valuable are the experiences as a result of rebounding, right? That it's not just, I, you know, I came in and I sat for this exam and I passed and it was great. It's, I really had to work hard and it becomes so much more valuable to them, which I think is so amazing. Which brings to the point what you were mentioning about the competition it definitely is something that you have to earn it's something that you have to work really hard to be able to do and I wanted to talk about your experience particularly with the MOSS competition and how you learned about it and how you decided you know I really want to get my students involved in this event. So it was about eight years ago I took a workshop from Kathy Schmidt and I was trying to remember whether she was a teacher at that time or whether she was working for CCI Learning. I think she was a teacher about, yeah, eight years ago, she still would have been teaching. Yeah, I think so. So she was, she was my mentor. I, you know, every question I have, um, she was so enthusiastic and she still is willing to help and answer any questions. And so when I went to the workshop, I can't remember, I think she even brought um, Ashley Masters or she was talking about Ashley and her experience um, and her kids and competition and tips and techniques and, and all of that. And that really got my attention. And then I took that information back to my class and I had one student and Diana Carenza, she was sitting there and I had her for accounting and my Microsoft class. And she's like, she's like Eckelman. She's like, let's go for competition. And of course I, I, I held back and I'm like, what? <laughs> I just talked about the opportunity. What you want to do this? And she's like, yeah. And it was her senior year and she pushed me. And then I turned around and I pushed her and she tested and tested and tested, and she actually got second place. Um, she had to go to Camp Auburn, and so we missed out about a week of competition. But it was her enthusiasm, and the kids around her saw her, 
and they, they, they saw how hard she was trying. And all you could hear when she's testing is the click of the mouse. And, you know, the kids are like, what is she doing? Playing solitaire? No, she's, she's aggressively, you know, just diving into these tests and retesting. And, and it's, again, it's that learning lesson for me as an instructor to watch perseverance and just to see, you know, she's every day just dig in her heels and she would just constantly test. And so she actually broke the ground for starting. We have been going since that time. I've been taking the kids to U.S. nationals from that point forward. And I've actually had taken two students to world competition. And quite honestly, I never thought in my wildest dreams that I ever would take a student to world because, you know, that's, that's like the icing on the cake. That's the cream of the crop. And, and uh, to have a, have the privilege to take two students twice um, is just, just a true honor. Well, and I, I feel like you've mentioned this briefly, but I know Washington in particular is such a competitive state. You guys have really, I think the state has such an amazing vision for certification, which is so powerful. But in, on the flip side of that, it makes it really hard for students, and this could be said for several other states as well, makes it really hard for students to be able to get that top score and get that invitation to compete at the U.S. National Championship. So what do you do to help your students earn those top scores? I know you talked about um, students testing multiple times, but I know there's, there's other things that go into that. So what are the things that you do to help your students get the scores that they need to be able to come and compete? Yeah, so absolutely. Auburn, Washington is right in the backyard of Microsoft. And so I always get in trouble when I start talking to other teachers about the time. So I can't talk about the times of my kids, um, but I can tell you that my kids work tremendously hard at trimming their time, not only to have a perfection score, but to trim down to their fastest time. And so the first thing I do with my kids is, is we literally kind of have an informal agreement. You know, it takes dedication, commitment, perseverance. It takes time, you know, away from my curriculum to a degree because I have kids testing on the side while I'm teaching my classes um, and they might come in before school or after school or during lunch. Um, but I really have them make a commitment um, to the process of testing and testing and have that perseverance kind of for the long haul. And there's two windows of opportunities for competition. There's the fall and then there's the spring. So I really try to jump on the fall um, just because then I can start planning for accommodations for the expenses. Um, so I know what's kind of coming down the road so I can really kind of have a budget and plan. Uh, but again, I always pick up kids in the spring also uh, just because I get kids that are excited. They, they see other kids testing in the fall and then they decide, wait a minute, I want to do this too. So the first focus is accuracy for my kids. Once they make a commitment, you know, we both decide, you know, I'm like, can I travel with a student? <laughs> can they travel with me? Right. Or, or will they need to take their parent because um, there's no way I'm going to travel with a student? No, just kidding. Um, but that's the first thing is just the dedication and commitment. It's, you know, it's like any sport of activity um, or sport, you know, we're in it for the season. We're in it for, in this case, the, the finals, the finales, which hopefully will be you know, U.S. nationals, and then ideally dream world would be to go to world. And so that's, I think, the biggest thing is the dedication, the commitment. Do my students have perseverance? Are they in it for the long haul? Or is it, you know, sometimes high school kids, they, they apply for a job, they get a job, and they're, they're in it for like a week or two, and then they're done. So it's like, wait a minute. No, this is a commitment. So once I get my kids to commit and to try, um, you know, I always ask them to do their best. Um, then I support them. And then they first take their tests and they go for accuracy. Once, once a student passes a Microsoft exam, they can take it again and again. So it's not like they have to wait another day or if they fail, they have to skip 24 hours. Literally, once they pass a Microsoft exam, game on, the next second, they can launch it again. So again and again and again. So I'll have my students, depending upon their time, they literally will test, you know, sometimes 20 to 30 times a day, just depending upon, you know, how fast they've trimmed their time. Um, so accuracy is the first goal. You know, I always tell my students to read the task question on the project exam, read it once for comprehension and read it again for action. Because if they're like me, I read it too fast and then I skip pieces. And so when you're trying for, to go for perfection, the first thing is, you know what, let's not focus on the time at all. Let's just focus on accuracy. 
the first hurdle is to get to 100%. And you'll see kids as they go through this process is trying to get to 100%. They, they feel it's like climbing a mountain. It's very daunting. So, you know, perfection is hard. And so you're trying to figure out the sort of port that's created these tests. You're trying to figure out the programmer, what they're thinking, you know, how you can write a technical sentence and it can mean more than one thing. So what exactly are they looking for? So I think accuracy is the first challenge, the first battle or the first hill to climb. Once a student's focuses on accuracy, they get a perfect score. We print it. I put it up on the classroom whiteboard. <laughs> you know, we celebrate that success. And then game on, we start focusing on speed. And, you know, it's, it's not that it's, you know, you need to be trimmed to this particular second or, you know, these minutes. It's just, okay, so you got perfect score. Now let's go ahead and let's, let's track time. So as an instructor, I can go in and I can see I can run a report that can see exactly what their time is. You know, before Kathy, I used to have a stopwatch. <laughs> She's like, Patty, you can go in as an instructor for the administration access and you can go pull report. I'm like, oh my gosh, Kathy, where have you been? <laughs> so when you learn tips like that from networking, oh my goodness, it's just a time saver because, you know, I'm distracted on my stopwatch. Um, you would see when during COVID I had one of my students was testing remotely and one was testing in the classroom and trying to keep between the two of them, their tests continuing to go and trying to track their time. It was just, I felt like it was a full-time job on my end just to just run the tests. And so it's hilarious because my kids are just like clicking away and they're all stopping at different times anyway. Um, so just again, the, the second focus is speed. So once the student starts to trim down their time. And it's a slow process. You know, like I said, it doesn't happen overnight. You're going to see in a couple of weeks after my kids t um, test, again, it's that perseverance. It's that dedication um, because in a weird way, they, off, they kind of memorize the test. I mean, just quite honestly, because it's, it's a repetitive skill. They're, from, they're familiar with the questions. And once they start to go, and then now it's like game on shortcuts. So keyboard shortcuts, right mouse clicking, copy paste, whatever you can do to trim off seconds. If you're in Excel, use a wizard, right? Don't hand type a formula. Um, so knowing those types of quick shortcuts is going to shave off seconds. And, you know, if you're like a swimmer and you're talking about trimming your time, every single thing you can do to kind of pivot to trim off time in the end is going to make a difference between whether you qualify for the state championship um, and that's going to be a big deal. The other thing I have my kids do is, is Google. So they jump to YouTube. Um, we watch Brendan Sinclair. <laughs> and it's funny because I talk to other teachers. They're like, you know, Brendan Sinclair too. I'm like, yeah, because I YouTube, I just did a search and he has tips and techniques about, you know, um, certification. And so I'm like, thank you. I don't even know you, Brendan, but thank you so much because my kids are like, who's that? I'm like, yeah, that's a person on YouTube you need to get to know because his tips and his you know, polishing skills and what to expect. Um, it has been just an, an awesome resource. Um, you know, the other thing is I just have kids go through the entire ribbons and launching boxes just to see what's where. Um, it's just about familiarity. And so when my kids qualify for Washington State Championship, then it's like the fine details of, of again, what is most commonly used in business. So they search it um, as far as Microsoft Office products. We're trying to anticipate what's going to be on um, the next new test format that, my, that none of the kids have seen before. So we're trying to find those unique instances as, of how businesses might use um, that software and, and what would, for example, a company like Certiport be asking about. So I feel like there's a lot that I wanted to make sure we covered there. I feel like you've been doing this for long enough that you have the whole the whole process so polished. I did just want to say for our listeners, for our listeners who are coming from different states, Washington is such a unique yeah. testing environment. And and Patty has polished a whole system and and has a really competitive environment that she's working from. But the most important thing that I wanted to call out is the the shooting for perfection. I think that is the best way to prepare your students for the competition because if they have mastered the exam enough to be able to get a perfect score, they have such an incredible comprehension of the application of the testing environment that they 
they will do wonderfully at, at the U.S. National Championship. Another thing that I wanted to call out that you mentioned is um, the fact that you've had students go on to the World Championship and how that's like a, a, a completely separate uh, testing environment, a completely separate experience. And so it's one thing to have your students qualify to compete at U.S. Nationals because they're familiar with the certification exam. Many of them, to your point, have taken the exam multiple times. But when they get to the competition, it's an entirely different experience. It's more project-based. It's a different type of format. So what do you do to get your students prepared for, for that level of competition? You know, it's one thing to come have the exam kind of memorized and to know kind of what someone's going to ask. What are some of the things that you can help them do similar to what you said before about memorizing the functions of the ribbon? What are some things that teachers can do to get students ready, not just for the certification exam, but for any question, I guess, that sort of work could throw their way? You know, um, so we use a program called Geometrics. And so Geometrics is also sold by Certiport. And it's a, um, a program that lets kids practice and kind of feel like what the test looks like. You could turn on the timer. You can turn off the timer. Um, you can do specific tasks individually. So if I have kids go through and do a, like a skill review, they can pick and choose. And each question is independent. So it's like they need help with um, doing a, a slide zoom in PowerPoint. They can go find that task and just do that task. And so when kids are reviewing, it's not like they're starting from scratch and you know trying to relearn the whole program. They're trying to find the gaps of what they don't know, or maybe they've done it once and now they just need to practice it because it's not quite fresh in their memory. Um, you know, macros in Excel, you know, it just it just all depends upon um, kind of where their skill set is and what they just need to dial in. Like I said, again, just searching most used functions for businesses. Um, there's a lot of YouTubes out there that we use. Um, I have in the class, I've used a program called Jasper Active before. Uh, I was also used a program called SAM that, again, kind of builds that skill set up. Uh, but the biggest thing is just getting used to the technical language. You know, there's so many different ways to interpret or so many different ways to perform a task question on a computer. So it's just no matter how you perform that task question, just as long as you're addressing the technical question. So sometimes, especially with my students that speak multiple languages, they have to go, wait a minute, Eckelman, what does it mean to merge? What does it mean to... Um, edit or what does it mean to modify? You know, it just for a lot of us, you know, if if English is our first language, we don't think twice. But some of my kids are like, wait a minute, Ekman, I know three different languages. What does this word mean? Um, because we use a lot of those similar purpose words, but so many different words can mean the same thing. So it's the technical language that I think that can throw kids. Um, when they're trying to really focus uh, on it, you know, it's the technical language. Yeah, I know that that has come up quite frequently. And in the process of localizing our exams for the World Championship, for example, it's all about knowing how Microsoft phrases that particular function. So being able to not just know what it does, but know the nomenclature, I think that's super important. Because when you're going to the exam, the, the certification and at the competition will use the verbiage that is used by Microsoft to describe that particular function. So if you've been calling it the snip and clip feature, you know, and you know what I mean? If it's, if it's not what Microsoft has called it before, then it's right. going to be hard for you to be able to perform well on the exam, because even if you know how to do it, if you don't know what it's called, you're not going to be able to, to bring that forward um, come game time, which I think is super important. Yeah. And, and just using your, your resources. So for example, using your notepad to copy and paste text. Mm -hmm. um, my kids were um, just, just mentioning, you know, when you walk into the competition, just, just breathe, right. Just um, know that you, you, you've already had success. You're a champion, but when you walk in, you just kind of walk in just with an open mind and just knowing that you have that confidence. And that's my biggest thing is just to really talk to my kids that, that they already know what they're doing. Now it's just a matter of sitting in the environment because, you know, again, not everyone loves a test environment, me in particular, um, but it's just walking in. And, you know, I was talking with Kathy Schmidt before about kids competing and you see kids come walking out of competitions where they couldn't find files and, you know, tears are running down their face. And it's just, it, it's 
hard to see those kids in that situation because, you know, if they had longer time, then they could, they could eventually find it. But when you are in that testing environment and, and obviously the quality is important and then the time is second important, Mm -hmm. then those kids are like starting to just, just panic. And, you know, anxiety is definitely, especially over the last couple of years for pandemic has definitely risen to the top of a conversation where um, kids, it triggers a lot of things for kids. So, yeah. Well, I, I'm just so impressed in thinking about all of the soft skills. I mean, I, I almost hate calling them that because I feel like they're almost more important than some of the other, but the soft skills that come along with preparing for these types of things, talking about perseverance and dedication and mindfulness is such a huge part of it because you, you have these students who have worked all year or, you know, all semester to be able to master this technology, but it's being able to calm yourself enough to be able to bring that to your recollection, because it might not be something that you've done recently, but being able to perform in the moment when you need it requires a sense of, of peace and calm that I think some students aren't able to bring to themselves in the moment of taking an exam. So if you're, if you're going to be competing on a world stage or a national stage like this, I think you really do need that level of maturity to be able to say, you know what, I can do this. And I know that I've learned it. I just need to be able to think through critically what's kind of being asked of me in the moment. And just more for me, the sentimental I've had kids. um, So my, my current senior who just graduated Alejandro, um, he competed the three years, one year it was canceled because of COVID, but his freshman year, it was the first time he'd ever flown ever in his life. And so, you know, from a teacher's point of view, it's like, okay, so now I need to get him ready for the, just the process of flying, you know, what to say, what to do, how to pack, what you can, what you can't pack in your suitcase. And here's the process that we go through. Um, And then it's, you know, it's what to wear for the competition. You know, I've had students in the past where they literally, they have nothing. So financially for them to dress up, you know, so I've, I've called on, you know, my mom and other businesses to donate, to create outfits for our kids. Um, You know, all the time at the competition is, is very casual, uh, but the, the part of dressing up, that's a skill set for kids to even get to that point where you're, you're representing yourself. It's like a job interview. What do you wear? How do you act? Um, How do you polish yourself so that you are marketing your best self. Um, and it's, it's the experience that you get a chance to see. Um, Alejandro, his freshman year was super sh- quiet, super, super shy. I remember walking up to him and I'm like, you know, hey, you should go for competition because you're so fast in class. I'm like, you should think about competition. He's like, you know, oh, maybe, maybe. And so after a couple of days later, he's like, oh, Eckelman, I think I, think I want to try with what you were talking about. And this last year, he was the one that, again, he's blossomed from being so quiet and shy. He was doing the mechanical bull riding. He was doing the armadillo racing in Texas. He was, my other student was the first in line to walk across the stage. And these are two shy kids. I mean, you know, when you talk about, you know, I'm, you know, I kept saying meet people. So they, they met friends at the competition and, you know, just, they just blossomed. And so when you look at, you know, yes, the competition is just amazing in itself, but what my kids take away for life experiences, you know, that kid will have in his memory the first time he's ever flown was with a group of three other high school students and myself. And uh, he was the only, only male student going. And, you know, the four of us, you know, made him, you know, we, at that time it was uh, Orlando. So we went to Animal Kingdom and made him do several rides that he probably didn't want to do and uh, just really have a chance to really work with kids on a whole different level. You know, it's just my kids that I take to competition are just, are just like family. And, you know, they'll, they'll keep in touch with me, um, send me emails down the road um, and just always have that kind of forever connection where we have these great memories. Well, and to be able to create those memories, I know you touched on this briefly. It, there's a lot that goes into this. You talked about Alejandro in, in particular, that you had to walk him through, you know, the process of preparing for a trip and dressing up. And, and there's so many different pieces that go along with preparing for the competition. And I know one of them for your district and for very, very often I get 
this question or did get this question a lot when I was working on the competitions is how do we pay for this? You know, I really want my students to have this experience, but our district or, you know, our school doesn't have the funding to be able to pay for our students to come. So you, you've talked about this, we were talking about this briefly before, how have you done fundraising or what's been the best way, most effective way you've noticed to cover the costs and get your students um, to be able to have this, you know, potentially once in a lifetime experience? Right. And so one of the things, you know, that I thought as a teacher was the hardest part is getting kids to competition. I thought, oh my goodness, that's the mountain. I climb the mountain. And then all of a sudden I'm like, wait a minute, what? There's no money? How am I going to get my kids and myself to competition? And so last year, I mean, I just have to do a shout out to Auburn School District. Uh, With COVID, with our CTE department, um, they were able to pay for our expenses for not only my three students, but myself. And that was just oh my gosh, a game changer. Uh, From a teacher's point of view, um, not having my kids worry about the finances, you know, they paid for their souvenirs and some snacks, but everything was covered. And so that was just a dream. Um, So if if that's, you know, your district, then please thank them afterwards, because, you know, that is, that is just, it makes everything just so much more memorable. Um, But what I've had to do in the past is I've had to do fundraising. And I don't know about other teachers, but fundraising is hard. You know, um, I haven't had a chance to sell wrapping paper or candy because it's competitive and then you have to get approval and then you run into the health situation where you can't sell candy, at, you know, so it gets complicated, but um, look for grants. Um, sometimes your school might have a local community grant for kids. Um, the biggest thing that I push for is our booster auction. So we have a high school booster auction. It's held in the spring, but it's kind of a planned process right as soon as school starts. So we get donations and it could be making a survival basket for college kids and putting notepads and highlighters and blankets and bundling them up as a basket. And then at the booster auction, then it gets sold. And then a percentage of the sales goes back to my my students and myself to help pay for expenses. So that's for, for myself and my students, that's probably the easiest, but it's, you know, it's hitting the pavement and it's going around to local businesses asking them if they can donate uh, to these baskets. And, you know, we try to get as many baskets as we can. We decorate them up. Um, we talk about competition. So when, you know, the parents and, and uh, support people are sitting down at the auction, they can, they can get some history about certification and where their money is going and, and why is it, you know, helping these students with competition. You know, the other thing is um, Kathy Schmidt gave me the idea of business donations where you can write a letter or take the letters in or have the students go and ask for donations to support them in their their competition experience. But you're right. I think the the second hurdle is the expense um, because like the competition that I went to last in uh, Dallas, Texas was I took three students and myself and it definitely, you know, it's about a $7,500 expense. And so um, that's a lot of money. (laughs) And so trying to to fundraise um, and just again, reach out and um, ask for support, or oftentimes we would have somebody donate like a timeshare, and then that would be the big ticket item that would be auctioned off at the auction, and then that would be a a great source of raising funds. But that's something to consider as well. Um, Networking with other teachers, I strongly recommend, and I I must admit this is the first time that I've attended for the the, the Certiport's uh, certified conference. In the past, I've always gone as the teacher. <laughs> and I've had a chance to network with a lot of parents, right, that were supporting their kids going to competition. And I always kind of wondered what was going on the other side of the, the conference, but really just having a lot of fun with my students. And then this last year, I went ahead and I took a second chaperone and I actually participated in the certified conference. And then I'm like, wait a minute, what a huge networking opportunity to work with, oh my gosh, middle school, high school. Um, college level um, CTE directors, uh, and everybody is just so excited about benefits for kids for all types of certification through Certiport, um, and it, that's that's your team of support. So it was an amazing experience. Well, and I love that you have so many ideas, and I won't get into because we could be here all day. My own thoughts about <laughs> why teachers have to fundraise this much, and then you know, it seems like there's always money for the football program. But anyway. <laughs> I I just admire so much and I want to give a shout out to teachers like you across the country who 
basically take on a second job to be able to give students opportunities like this. Because to your point with Alejandro, he's completely blossomed from from this experience. And I know that that's a similar story for a lot of students. Ashley Masters in particular is one who comes to mind. Ashley's also from from Washington State um, and came to the competition one of the first years that I was involved um, and was early on in her high school career. And I was able to watch her kind of go through the high school experience, talking to Kathy, who was another um, Washington educator. And the difference between Ashley when she first started and Ashley, when she had competed for her third and final time, I mean, it was just night and day. She gained so much confidence and I admire her so much because now she's been able to leverage that into an incredible college experience and is now getting her master's degree and is employed by Microsoft. I mean, you just, you can't make this stuff up because some of these kids are just so incredibly powerful and successful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to, to hear from you. I know Alejandro was an experience that you mentioned, but what are some other experiences that you've had with your students at the Moss Championship over the years? You know, um, other experiences, and just before I forget, um, in your classroom, I literally take every student that, that passes their certification, print out their certificate, and that is my decoration in my classroom. You know, it's just like putting the student's name on the board. <laughs> and then when, my, and it's, it's a competition. So literally every semester, I take down all the decoration, and we start again. So it's, it's momentum, it's motivation. I keep telling my kids, your goal is to get your certification up in the classroom. Um, so that not only is decoration, number one, uh, it's beautiful. Our school colors are orange and blue. So thanks to Certiport, hope you never change your colors, uh, which really helps for myself in decorating with our school colors. Um, the other thing is I do posters. So um, I know there's several websites out there that do posters, but Costco, um, I take all of the kids from the competition and I make posters. So every experience, all the field trips that we take, um, we're close to Microsoft. So I have um, neighbors and I also have, um, through connections of Certiport, I have people working at Microsoft that will host my kids for the day and they'll, we'll, we'll go up to Microsoft. Um, they'll talk about their career. Um, we'll have, we have a chance to see the corporate campus. And I don't know if you've had a chance to see the Microsoft corporate campus, but it's just mind blowing. Um, the kids get a chance to eat lunch there. They never want to come back to school. <laughs> so, you know, there's a visitor center. Um, a lot of things have changed since COVID. So I'm hoping that we'll come back to that. But, you know, I just I just really feel that if I can make connections between school to work and college to career, uh, Diana Carenza, she actually went to community college. She got her four-year uh, degree at that same community college in networking security. And she actually contracts now for Microsoft. So a couple of years ago, we actually went to Microsoft. I took my students and then Diana met us for lunch because she was, you know, near the Microsoft campus. So it's just when you think about, you know, those types, you know, when Diana was going on the field trip, she's like, Ackleman, someday I'm going to work at Microsoft and I'm going to have you, you know, we're going to get lunch and we're going to sit down and have lunch together. I'm like, yes, we will. And I'm going to hold you to it. And then you're going to host a group of kids, you know, so it's that that kind of um, experience. And my two students, my two sisters, you know, I had um, me and Lynn that were competing a couple of years ago in Atlanta, Georgia. And it was me that that literally started. Um, she qualified in the fall and the, no, no, Lynn qualified in the fall. And me was her older sister saying, I want to go to competition. And I go, well, if you want to go to competition, then you need to compete. I just can't randomly take you as a student. And so in the spring, I made me compete. She's like, what? Well, what I didn't realize is I had him compete in the same program. So we got to Atlanta, Georgia. They're walking in to test. And of course, they're testing against each other, right? <laughs> so as a teacher, I'm like, I'm like torn down the middle going, you know, what have I done? And then the rolling joke is, I mean, no, not a joke, but um, Lynn ended up winning. And so, you know, the fun thing, though, is is me is such a supportive sister. And no matter how it would have turned out, they would have supported each other either way. And we actually went to world. All three of us went to world competition and Lynn went to world. Me was the chaperone. And then our school district paid my way to go. So all three of us, we had that experience in Atlanta 
And then we had the experience of all three of us going together the world. And so, you know, and those, those two sisters, they still keep in touch with me. They email me, you know, during COVID, it was hard um, because they were going to, they finished their two-year community college and now they're in four years college. And so again, just having those long-term relationships that they, they just have, have really had the chance to have maturity um, through competition. Um, they've had a chance to work with a teacher on a, kind of a different level. Um, you know, we, we talk about setting goals and organizing and packing and what are you going to wear? What are you going to bring? How are we going to financially pay for this? And so um, they actually had to do a presentation in front of um, a small board in our uh, school district. And I, and I told my CT director, I said, you know, these ladies are super nervous. English is not their first language. And you're going to make them get up and do a, a presentation about competition. And, and they said, yes. And I said, well, okay, so give them some grace. Um, but they, they totally rose to the occasion and, you know, they didn't want to do it, but they did it. And again, I think it, it makes them more of a, a well-rounded um, person for that experience. Not that they loved it at the time, but it was like, <laughs> I kept telling my CT, CT director, I'm like, well, wait a minute, this, this is not fair. You're asking them to you know, do a presentation and they're not comfortable and, you know, basically don't make them do it. I'll do the presentation for them. And, and he's like, no, we want to hear from the students. So I'm like, hey, <laughs> but again, you know, I think that which doesn't push us, uh, you know, challenge us, um, doesn't make you stronger. So sometimes it's uncomfortable. And, uh, well, and I love, I love what you said that they rose to the occasion and that's, I think more more than anything, what I see out of the students, in particular those who are able to come to the competition, is how we don't give these young people enough credit. I mean, they just have amazing capabilities and amazing dedication and perseverance that I <clears throat> I don't think a lot of times we give this generation credit for. And it's wonderful to be able to see that perseverance and see just how powerful these kids really are. And I admire so much teachers like you and the work that you do, because I know that it's all of you guys running around behind the scenes, pushing them and giving them this opportunity. And so to that point, I wanted to ask, you know, what advice would you give to other educators? I know that there, every teacher who's ever been able to come to certified and has watched the award ceremony, they just say, oh, gosh, you know, I want to give my kids this opportunity. So what what advice would you give to these listeners who are saying, you know, I want, I want to bring Patty Eckelman energy into my classroom. What do I do to get, what do I do to get my students to the Moss Championship? You know, I think it, it's the kids that motivate me, you know, and it's the starting point, you know, as, as a starting teacher, starting certification, I would network, I'd reach out, I'd reach out to me. And, and how do you, how do you get that enthusiasm? It's through the experience. It's through trying. You know, every time a student takes a Microsoft exam, they are participating in the competition. So some states actually have kids go to U.S. nationals where they've taken the test once and they've gotten a perfect score. And so just keep in mind, I'm Washington State. So the 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 competition rigor is very high. And so I know I know what's going to be um, a qualified time to even be considered ongoing. And I know it's a perfect score. Um, and I know that it's going to be a, a pretty darn fast time. And so with that, I keep telling my kids, we're going to set a goal. And so my kids, I said, you know, you're going to set a goal eventually. You know, I don't do it right away. But I, towards the end, when I know that the time's coming up for the deadline at 12 o'clock at midnight, I tell my kids, I'm like, okay, I need you to set a goal. It's not a goal that I have. What, I know it's a perfect score, but what time do you want to have that you felt like you've tried your best? And that you can live with that time. And when it's all said and done, you can sit back and go, you know what? I pushed myself to the best time I can do. And so I have my kids set that goal and they write it down. And then, and it's funny because most of the time, you know, when you write it down, write down a goal, you see it and then it becomes more obtainable and then they do it. So then it's like, okay, I come in. I did that. I got that time. Now what? And I'm like, well, are you, you know, you should be content. That's exactly where you wanted to be. Oh no, I'm going to take it a couple more times. <laughs> you know, that's how it is. But unless you take it in kind of baby bites, right? You don't sit down and go, okay, you know, you're going to get your fastest time. You're going to get a perfect score and it's going to happen overnight. That's not. 
um, you know, a skill has to be polished and evolved. Um, and it's kids are going to make mistakes. I don't know about you, but the faster I work, the faster I talk, the more mistakes I make. And so it's a process. It's a journey. Um, so when you talk about number one is the commitment from the kids. You know, I get all of my kids motivated. I tell them they all can participate in this competition. And I open the door for every single kid. I'm like, hey, every single one of you is going to take the Microsoft exam. You're going to automatically qualify for this competition just because you've taken an exam. Now, what's the next step? And it's those kids. And then I know high school kids are busy. They have activities. They have jobs. Um, Some of them are taking multiple credits to recapture from maybe COVID. Uh, for not, not maybe doing the best their freshman year. Um, so they have a lot of other challenges that they're balancing. But I think for a lot of my kids, you know, once they carve out a little bit of time and whether they come before school or after school or during my class time, um, through their dedication and perseverance, we can actually literally set a path for success. And, and that's, and, you know, and if they, they miss it, <laughs> then, you know, they got most likely second or third, or, you know, they've, they've really pushed it till they've, they sit back and go, you know what, I've done my best. And, and that's what I asked. For them. And, and ultimately that's what we want. Right. And I just feel that giving, opening the door, mm-hmm. I love that word, opening the door to allow students to see, you know, this is possible for you mm-hmm. is really what the competition is all about. It's being able to say, you know, all of the students who come to this competition came because they earned a certification. So it's all about taking that first step, right? To learning the skills, to mastering them, and then just allowing them to see the possibilities that are in front of them. For some of these students, it's something that they just feel is completely outside of their capabilities, which is absolutely untrue. You know, if they've earned the certification, it's open to them. And so I just think opening that door, it you are the vision board, right? You're the teacher that can show them this is what's possible. And so Patty, to you and to all of our educators who are involved in the Moss Championship and our other events and certification programs, I just want to say thank you for all of the work that you're doing. And it doesn't go unnoticed by us. And I know it doesn't go unnoticed by your students in your community because there is a lot of value in the work you do. Oh, well, thank you so much. Like I said, it's the kids that lead the program. It's the teachers that are along for the ride and it's networking with other instructors. It's, it's company support with Certiport um, that literally creates this whole team in support of kids. And so when you have that and you, you kind of learn kind of the, the, the techniques, the software programs to use, um, the rigor that's expected, uh, the financial uh, piece that has to be organized, um, it's just about putting all the pieces of the puzzle together. Uh, in order to have success. And, and I always, every single year, I'm always looking for that student or several students, you know, I've taken anywhere from one to four kids to competition. And so I'm looking for those kids that are just going to give a little bit more extra. And it's not the kids that are typically that's in the sports programs, the Mm -hmm. drama programs. You know, if you think of my kids like Alejandro, Adria, um, Adria's in band, uh, just super quiet and shy. And if you ask them to, you know, speak in front of the class, it would be crushing for them. They could do it, but it would be nerve wracking. But this mm-hmm. is this, I think Certiport gives a chance for all kids, you know, um, the opportunity to compete. Um, and I always compare it to like an Olympic event. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes if you take a swimming event, do you think those um, Olympians get tired of swimming? <laughs> you know, yeah. Do they want to do you want to test again and again and keep going and, and, you know, get up every single day and, you know, for years, I mean, you talk about, you hear of Olympians since they were three years old, mm-hmm. trying to fine tune their skill. And so again, I use that as a great analogy um, for the, the winter and summer Olympics of, of how these athletes from around the world take on dedication and challenge and perseverance and, you know, what a fun opportunity they get a chance to compete something right in the classroom. Well, in our Microsoft Olympians, I, <laughs> I couldn't think of a better way to describe that. So thank you so much, Patty, for sharing your experiences with us and the stories of your students. It's been incredibly powerful and motivating. We appreciate you. Absolutely. Thank you.
Thanks for listening to another episode of our podcast. We're so happy to have you as part of our certified community. Make sure to follow and rate our podcast so that we can bring more educators into our wonderful and supportive group. We're also here to connect, so feel free to join us by visiting www.certified.certiport.com.